Tim, uh, Tim Sell in my team has this great saying that when um, he doesn't call me a manager, he calls me a host, which is very true because we're just all engineers in Google and we're all engineers here in this room, right? So I think that's more important for me than anything else. Um, lots of you have actually already seen me before. I know lots of familiar faces here in the room. Um, so that's why I've presented a slightly different talk today. And you see that already in the, in the title, um, it says my favorite announcements from, from Cloud Next. Um, there's two reasons why, why I put this my in here. Um, the first one is I know all of you know GCP and know Google Cloud, probably many have watched the live stream or anything. So I just wanted to give you a little bit more personal view, what I found like interesting rather than giving you the official rundown by, by importance. Um, but the second thing was also um, that I want to make this session very, very interactive. And with my, I wanted to also invite all of you to a dialogue. Uh, we have officially 45 minutes, but I have quite a few videos at the end from demos that I, that I personally found pretty cool, but I can skip all of them. So let's please um, yeah, raise your hand, ask questions anytime in the middle. Um, let's just make this a session between all of us. Okay? This doesn't have to be um, a lecture, um, so please just yeah, raise your hand. Um, yeah, let's, let's talk. We have 45 minutes and um, there, is, there is no great conclusion at the end or something else that I'm going to present to you. So we can at any time slow down, speed up again. I'm very, I'm very happy to do anything. Okay, cool. Awesome. Any questions yet? Maybe regarding the file instructions. Okay, no. Okay, great. So um, yeah, let's go right in. So um, I was actually at Cloud Next in San Francisco. If you have never been, I can only suggest to go. Um, it's completely unbelievable because we are basically taking over a whole square mile of San Francisco in the middle of the city. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, what stood out for me was last year it was a lot about AI and ML and it was a lot of product focus last year. Um, this year it changed a little bit. Um, when I explain it, I usually say for me it changed from verticals like products to horizontals. Suddenly everything is integrated. And so we see that, for instance, that there was a lot of focus on openness and Google being the open cloud and the open source cloud. There was a lot of focus on security, which also, again, cuts through all of the products. A lot of focus on hybrid, working with other clouds, but also working on premise. And last but not least, integration between our products. So Reza, for instance, later is giving a pretty cool talk how BigQuery and Dataflow are now integrated. So that was really a very interesting change somehow for me. And I think also something that's very important for enterprises and generally for all kinds of companies, because that's what we all deal with every day. I used to be a software engineer and a data integration architect myself, and it's actually the, the connections that are the hard parts. That's what people always say in architecture diagrams, don't look at the boxes, look at the arrows. And so, and that was something that I really, um, really liked about CloudNex. So in that spirit, uh, I'm going to go through a few of the major announcements and what I found interesting about that. Again. Um, at any point in time, raise your hand, or if you have comments, it would be even better. If you say, I've used this, I don't like it because of blah, um, that would be awesome. Okay, cool. So, start with infrastructure and hybrid. Well, we've announced two new regions in Korea and in Utah, that's in the United States of America, um, bringing the total to 23. I'm going to have the next slide with an updated map in case you're interested. Um, then we have Anthos. I'm going to have Anthos later, I'm going to go specifically over that, but um, the one-liner is it's our cloud services platform and now rebranded as a complete suite for, for hybrid service solutions. And I think it's, it's pretty exciting, but it's also really, really complex, so that's why I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And then we have new VMs, in particular compute and memory optimized VMs. Um, I'm not sure who has seen the keynote, but there was a really cool demo of a live migration of Sapana. So if you don't know what SAP HANA is, um, SAP is an enterprise um, system for like everything enterprise basically, and HANA is an in-memory database, and that runs now on those memory-optimized VMs, so they have especially large and fast memory attached, um, and we were doing a live migration, basically shutting down certain instances, and you could see that SAP continued progressing transactions at exactly the same speed. It didn't lose a single transaction while um, the HANA migration was happening, so that was pretty cool. Um, What's interesting is you can now also use those VMs on GKE, on Kubernetes, and we also changed the UI. So I know, I guess none of you ever interacts with the UI with the Google Cloud Console. I do neither. I like scripting, but nevertheless, maybe have a look because the few assistants actually changed. So now if you start a GKE cluster, you can actually choose what you need. 
And it's nicely written in like terms that everyone understands. Like I want to optimize for machine learning. I want to optimize for SAP. And then you can choose your clusters depending on that. And that's possible because now we have those optimized VMs. And last but not least, um, that's something very interesting for enterprises. BYOL, that means bring your own license with sole tenant nodes. So you know there's a few enterprise products out there which have CPU-based licenses. And that in the past used to be a problem if you're running on VMs because what is the physical C CPU? Well, now we have sole tenant nodes, which means we can ensure only this VM is running on the actual hardware for licensing reasons. And you can bring your own license. So you don't have to purchase a license. And that's very important for customers who have, for instance, large contracts with, I don't know, Microsoft, Oracle, and so on, um, who, where you don't just pay for like one license. You don't want to pay that via Google. You have a massive enterprise contract that somehow covers all kinds of licenses in a model that, that we can't map otherwise. So now you can bring your own license and run that on um, sole tenant nodes, which is super cool. And we announced that as well. Any kind of questions for those announcements? Am I going too fast? Am I talking too fast, as usual? OK, faster, OK. Look, lots of people say that I talk too fast, so I try to be somewhere in the middle. OK, cool. I promised you the map. This is the last map, now the post next map of all of the regions um, that we have in the world. Um, and here are the new ones. So I just mentioned Seoul. And Utah is now officially on the map. And um, you also see Jakarta here. Jakarta is going to be launched. Um, I think later this year, beginning next year. What's interesting about Jakarta, and that's why I have put the next slide on here, of the upcoming network connections. Not sure if you knew that, but there is Indigo going online this year, which is the largest undersea cable in the whole region. And that's going to go via Jakarta. So, and of course, via Singapore. So I think if you have those kind of workloads, super interesting. Um, because, um, yeah, we, I guess you can expect much, much reduced latency in the future due to Indigo going from Sydney to Perth to Jakarta to Singapore and then even up. Yeah, and that's a, um, that's a collaboration between Google and um, between, I think, Telstra in, uh, in Australia, um, between um, Singtel and between, um, what is it called, in Jakarta, Indosat or something like this, Indotel. So that's super interesting and very exciting for me. I like networking stuff, and it's pretty cool to see how we're now integrating Asia as well. I think in the past, we didn't see much green in this area. And now it's really, really dense. So that's really good, really good to see. Yes? Sorry? Oh, those are, um, the, these are the, the names of the undersea cables. So you can literally go to go to Wikipedia, and there will be an article about, that's just a name, right? It says Indi, this is called Indigo, SGC, uh, SJC is the name of the, of the existing undersea cable that already connects Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore since 2013, which is one of the reasons why, for instance, if we have multi-region replication for, for high availability, that's why we always suggest Singapore, Hong Kong is a good connection, because we have a dedicated line uh, lying there. Yes? So total number of regions, 23, right? Um, did you just count them? Yeah, the <laughs> question is, uh, on the architect exams, mm -hmm. what you should answer? <laughs> well, I think it's, it's changing so much. The good news is it's changing so much that the documentation is inconsistent. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So you don't know what to what's the right answer? I can, I, can, I, can, I can calculate now again. I just literally this morning copied it out of the documentation. I hope 23 is still correct. Um, most likely the number will be higher. If in doubt, always choose the higher number. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, I'm going onwards to serverless and ops. So first of all, GKE on-prem. Who has heard about GKE on-prem already? That was actually pre-announced last year. Yeah. Cool. So what's good about this is this is now officially in beta. So you can actually request people like professional services, yours truly, to, um, to work with you to actually get a GKU on-prem installation. And we have actually installations running in, uh, in JPEG already. Um, just for the ones of you who don't know what that is, um, that means um, we run Kubernetes for you on-premise, so on your infrastructure. That means on your VMware. Um, we install a Google managed version of Kubernetes that is exactly the same as GKE and is connected to GKE. So you can manage your workloads in the cloud console, but have your on-premise GKE cluster running. We sometimes call that running on the edge, right? So you have, for instance, certain type of data that you have to 
keep in your data center or you have an application that for some strange requirements has to, has to be in your data center. Uh, I, for instance, I worked on a project that was a, t uh, a telephony um, application that needed some special hardware, fair enough, right? that, that can't move to the public cloud. But you can now use GK on-prem to only have the edge components running in your data center and connect it to GKE on the Google Cloud and have it all in one single pane of glass. So that's, that's pretty cool. Yes. Yes. The uh, question is, um, first of all, is there a hardware requirement or you guys run everything on VMware? It's all, VM, it's all VMware at the moment, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's so there's no hardware. hardware. Yeah. So as long as you are running on certified hardware, then it is supported, right? e Exactly, exactly. Um, so we actually have a partnership with VMware there, um, who then, again, also check the, the underlying hardware. The second question is, um, the GK means that, that there is no stretched cluster and all the worker nodes are on the prem. Yeah. Rather than half here and half there. Right? Yes, so just to repeat that question. So, sorry, the first question uh, that you asked was can I run it on hardware or is it always VMware? And my answer was it's VMware. And the second question was um, does that mean that I can split one cluster into on prem and into cloud or is it two different clusters? So, at the moment, it's two different clusters. Having said that, because we, we soon bring Anthos and the service mesh, this, this idea of a, of a cluster becomes a little bit more fluid, right? Because clusters can scale between different regions and clusters with Anthos. Soon as you, if you, if you run a service mesh, then you don't really care about the cluster anymore because we manage the clusters for you. It's all about workloads and services. But yes, at the moment, it's two clusters that are connected. Sorry? For service mesh, you mean Istio, right? Yes, exactly. Um, the so Anthos is more than that. That's what I'm saying. Um, um, is, like Istio is kind of a complementary to Anthos. That, uh, but not all the features of the cloud uh, GK is supported on prem, right? So yeah. uh, you cannot attach GPOs or uh, do you support supporting? So yeah. So the question was uh, not all of the features that um, that are um, on the cloud are supported on prem. That's that's correct because in the end, yeah, we don't know your hardware. So there is a choice between, for instance, yeah, we don't have spot instances or like um, preemptible instances, those kind of concepts we don't have um, because yeah, we can't control your hardware on-prem. Um, so normally you would have a fixed cluster um, that you dedicate for your GKE on-prem um, installation. But that's actually a good point. It's, I would be interested about the use case. So let's, let's maybe chat later over pizza. <laughs> I have plenty of things to <laughs> Cool, okay. Um, I'll continue. Uh, Cloud Run. Uh, what's Cloud Run? Um, Cloud Run used to be called in the past, uh, well, it's, it had different names, um, but this is basically, you would know uh, it as Knative. So that is the idea that you run cloud functions, but run cloud functions on Kubernetes, and you can decide yourself where you run them on. So you see this whole hybrid really coming through, both with GK on-prem and with Cloud Run, because our position is that just because you want to use functions, you shouldn't use a different framework for that. So if you use um, like another serverless function framework, you basically have a completely different development stack. And the idea of Cloud Run is it that actually you should use the exact same code. And it shouldn't matter whether you want to deploy it as a function and pay it for every call, or you want to deploy it on your existing GKE cluster and pay for the underlying infrastructure, for the runtime. This is a decision that someone else should make, not you as a developer. And that's where Cloud Run comes in. So you can now choose completely freely using Knative on all open source components, as usual with Google, um, how you want to run your workload. So it's real DevOps, right? You as a developer, you don't work around. Ops, you work together with Ops to find, uh, to find out what do you actually want to run and how do you want to run it. And that's really nice. Um, Nevertheless, we still had a few changes to App Engine, actually. We, had, uh, we have new runtimes, and we have a private GCP access there. Um, and what I want to particularly call out is Cloud Code. Um, why do I want to call that out? Um, this is a plugin for IntelliJ and VS Code. So we admit that VS Code is pretty cool. I use VS Code myself, so why not leverage it? And um, yeah, so we wrote actually a plugin for VS Code that you can now use all of those functionalities. For instance, the libraries for Cloud Run directly from VS Code. So you can write a function in VS Code and directly deploy it as a function into GCP out of VS Code, just completely seamless. But at the same time, you can still from VS Code decide, oh, I just want to run it on my existing GKE cluster, or I want to run it on GKE on-prem. And all of that is possible with just like one click. And again, all open source and all transparent so that you know what's actually happening behind the scenes. Okay, networking. Uh, traffic director, I'm gonna talk about that later. Traffic director 
is basically a service mesh that doesn't require services. That's a hard, <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting way of explaining it. That means we can, we use a proxy, like for instance, like an Envoy proxy, but we provide your control plane, a control plane that uh, configures all of your proxies in a way that we can, that you can control the overall network traffic, even if you're not using containers and even if you're not service-based. So we also use Traffic Director internally if you use services and if you use containers, but with Traffic Director, we also offer you the same if you're not doing that, which is, again, like a very open um, approach. Um, then we have private Google Access. Um, that is now launched. Uh, that's now generally available. That's something especially interested for, uh, interesting for enterprises. You can basically disable that from your GCP, you can access anything else. So you get private API endpoints, you can literally even block the DNS access, so you cannot go outside of the cloud, and also not you cannot, you cannot connect to your services from on-prem somewhere else. Um, this normally is not a problem because you have IAM permissions, but this, um, this reduces the, the insider problem. So what do you do with someone who gets somehow rogue permissions that someone just escalated, and now that person has permissions they shouldn't have, but they still have access to your systems, and with that you can, you can reduce this. So that person could still only access your front end and nothing else on, on GCP because you have defined uh, parameters. We also now offer 100 gigabyte interconnect. That's a lot. Um, that's, that's per second, by the way, just in case you were, you were wondering. <laughs> um, and uh, high availability VPN. We always used to have a solution for high availability VPN, but that was, um, you, you had to configure that manually. Um, it, was, it was available, but you had to know what you're doing, and now you can just directly set up high availability VPN. Okay, I'm continuing to security. I just mentioned the private API access. If you want to bring that even one level down, we have VPC service controls now. I actually worked with a large banking client um, over almost a year, uh, last year to introduce that. That really brings it down to the network level. So you can exactly say, for instance, from BigQuery, if you're exporting data, it can only go to this bucket and only this group of users is allowed to export it to this bucket. So very, very, very fine, fine granular permissions. Again, something that normally you should solve with groups and role permissions, but if you have a, some kind of an insider risk or you know, you're not really sure who uses your service account in which way in your applications, you can, you can put this layer on top to make sure that there's no privilege escalation possible either. Um, something I'm going to talk about later is the Cloud Security Command Center and the Data Loss Prevention UI. So now in the UI, you have a lot more, um, lot more control over the security across all of your applications and across all of your projects. That's something that lots of um, enterprises have asked for to, um, because they have central security teams. And they don't care about the applications, they don't care about uh, your, your dev or ops teams, they are a separate security team, and they want to check the security for everything across all of your applications. And you can do that now with Cloud Security C Command Center. We also have um, scanners for, um, for the container registry and for VMs as well, so all kinds of vulnerability scanners included, um, and also authorization. So after you scan something and after you have basically provided um, evidence that this is a, um, a golden image, you can actually tag that and then only allow this to be deployed. And with shielded VMs, we go even one step further. Once you deploy that, we have even a runtime firmware that uses hardware modules to ensure that only this is run. And that's called a shielded, uh, a shielded VM. One last thing that's um, very often requested and finally here is a Microsoft Active Directory managed service. That means now you can actually, if you don't want to use cloud identity, you can still use your, um, your Active Directory and can actually sync that to, uh, to identities and that's as a managed service. So there's nothing you have to do yourself. Okay, I'm going a little bit fast here, but again, I'm always happy for questions. So I'm quickly pausing. So, so just now we yes. talked about uh, the cloud one. Do yep. we run on-prem? Yeah, so, so the question was, does, uh, does cloud run um, work on-prem? So cloud run itself is, is a cloud product, but everything under it runs on-prem. So you can either run it in GKE on-prem, or you can just use Knative yourself. Um, but of course, the whole idea behind serverless is that you don't have to manage it. So if you want to run everything on-prem, you most likely you don't get the full benefit out of Cloud Run. That's how I would put it, right? Because like you, you want not even to know where it's running. So like, but is it part of the uh, endos offering? So the question was whether it's part of the Anthos offering. No, it's uh, it's in parallel to that. It can work together with Anthos. So Anthos and Cloud Run are very tightly integrated. 
Um, but you don't have to use Anthos if you want to use Cloud Run. So Cloud Run is really more for the um, for the person who develops functions, you know, like like uh, like Lambda functions, and but still wants to have to to have to control over the infrastructure behind the functions, which not all other serverless offerings allow you to do. Okay, cool. Uh, storage. We have a new storage class announced. Um, it's called Archive Storage, sometimes called Ice Cold Storage, and this is basically to replace. Um, to replace your tape backups. So this is, this is a very, very um, uh, cheap uh, storage class, um, but that still allows you fairly short latency re requirements. Um, in the announcement blog post, there was, I'm going, and this is a quote, um, we wrote, it's not as glacially slow as other solutions. <laughs> you can make up that, what, what that means yourself. <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, it's basically, so it's still on hard drives, but it provides you all of the features that you, um, that you expect from a tape backup solution, um, especially in terms of cost. So that's a, that's a very interesting new, uh, new offering. Um, we also have File Store, that's our NFS offering, is now in, in GA, and also uh, provides now high availability and, um, and multi-regional replication if you need NFS storage. And then we have a few interesting uh, tiny changes that I still find somehow intriguing. So we have a bucket policy. That means you can now define permissions on a bucket level, not only for, for IRM groups themselves. So you can define different permissions even on objects inside buckets, similar to ACLs. And um, we, um, if you have your own um, signatures coming in, you, we now also support you to sign um, buckets and objects as well. Um, and I mentioned here BigQuery because we're now going a little bit into the data direction. If you never heard of BigQuery Data Transfer Service, this is an offering from us where we copy your data over. And um, one of the big announcements of Next that actually kind of went below the radar was that now we have over 100 integrators for BigQuery Data Transfer Service. So where we have a connector to your on-premise solution, for instance, Teradata, that migrates the data into BigQuery um, via, via Google Cloud Storage, typically exported in like Avro or Parquet or one of those formats. So that's why I mentioned it here under, under storage. So it always goes via cloud storage into BigQuery. Okay, let me quickly have a look at the clock. Okay, we're still doing fine. Data analytics, finally, my area. Whew, no one asked me too hard infrastructure questions. I'm not actually an infrastructure person. So thanks for not doing that. Now there's the area where I consider myself at least half an expert in. So please ask me questions here. Um, connected sheets, has anyone heard about that? Great, so we're gonna have a small video on that later because it's actually pretty cool. So, um, other question. Has anyone of you used Google Sheets before? Come on, send out Google Sheets, G Suite. Look up from your phones, exactly. Um, so, there is a limitation, similar to Excel as well, that you can have um, a, a maximum number of rows in that. It's a large number of rows, but nevertheless, there is a limitation. I reached the end, right? Huh? <laughs> I reached the end of Excel, right? Exactly. You reached the end, you reached the end of Excel. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's always a good news. Yeah. Um, anyways, yeah. So the uh, connected sheets, um, they basically erase that limit. So dynamically in the background, once you reach a high number of rows, we, we switch over to BigQuery. And you don't even notice that. So there's nothing you have to configure. We just basically plug in temporary BigQuery, and suddenly your Excel sheet gets like a turbocharger. So it's literally like turbochargers used to work in cars. I'm not sure if any one of you knows how they work, but basically the first RPMs, it doesn't do anything, and then there's a point when they click, it kicks in. So that's exactly the same thing. You use Sheets as long as it's powerful in the browser, and then at some point under the hood, bam, BigQuery comes in. And then you're getting really fast. So that's really, really cool, and I have a short video on that later. Why don't you put the BigQuery at the beginning? Some, sometimes people don't want that, right? The question was, why don't we pick BigQuery at the beginning? Fair point. I would also do that. But lots of people come from an Excel background or come from a, from a Sheets background, so they just like Sheets. Um, and to be fair, there's one valid point that I always bring is, like, Sheets is really nice for collaboration. If you have multiple people working together, and actually that's the video I'm showing later, um, how AirAsia completely changed their internal meeting culture, because now the numbers are just always there. So Nick Hunch from AirAsia is talking about how they used to always have two meetings. One meeting to talk about the numbers, and then in the middle, the data scientists had to get the new numbers, and in the second meeting to talk about the new numbers. And now they just do this within the meetings. So they just literally save 50% of all of the meetings. Can which is nice. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, this is a big number of meetings. Can you, can you help them to fix their booking engine as well? The question was, can I help them to fix their booking engine? I, um, I don't know anything about the specifics. I particularly like AirAsia, so uh, yeah, but look, yeah, 
I have a lot of problems with uh, booking Singapore Airlines and Lufthansa these days. <laughs> so maybe maybe all airlines have have their own problems. Yeah. It's also a complicated business, so we should give them kudos for that. Um, data fusion, that's our um, point and click, if you like UIs, um, ETL generator. So you can really, um, just similar to what, for instance, Informatica or IBM Data Stage offer you, so it's a UI where you can define your own uh, ETL pipelines. Um, at the moment we support Spark, but soon we're gonna support Dataflow and Beam as well. So it creates those pipelines for you based on a UI experience. If that's the kind of thing, it's awesome. Yes. Sorry. Is it under data fusion for Google and Salesforce collaboration? Mm -hmm. so the question was Google and Salesforce um, collaboration under data fusion. That's a good question. I'm not sure if data fusion has a Salesforce connector. I would think so because they have a lot of connectors. Um, and Salesforce is a partner of Google for, for instance, data transfer services to BigQuery. So I would expect something, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that, sorry. I don't know the details of that. So how is it different from data prep? From data prep, oh, that's a good question. Okay, so the question was, what's the difference to data prep? Um, data prep, as the name indicates, is really more for data augmentation in the beginning of the process, right? So you're cleaning up your data, you wanna, you wanna do exploratory data analysis, those kind of tools. Um, so data prep works with data fusion. It would basically be a step of data fusion. Data fusion is one level higher. Here you can say really, like all the way from the beginning, I want to ingest my files, I don't know, uh, I'm just making something up. You're getting mainframe files and you have to split, you know, do have some absidic logic, um, get that into CSVs, get that into BigQuery, do transformations inside BigQuery, and then overnight you ingest it somewhere else. That's something you would do in, in Data Fusion. You can't do that in Data Prep. So that's, it's way more complex, yeah. Um, then we announced Microsoft SQL Server uh, as part of Cloud SQL, now in beta. That's pretty awesome. So I managed SQL Server, that's pretty great. Especially if you then also use the, um, the managed Active Directory services. Um, then we have BigQuery BI Engine. BigQuery BI Engine, I'm gonna talk about later as well, so I'm skipping it a little bit. The one-liner is, this is basically in-memory BigQuery. So BigQuery has a, um, at the moment, BigQuery is optimized for very large queries. So the larger the query, the faster you are, basically. Um, but what happens if you really just wanna request one or two rows? Very, very small. What do you do? Um, and that's where BI Engine comes in. So BI Engine gives you super fast access to your, uh, to your recent data. It's basically like an in-memory caching layer that returns you millisecond um, latency for those kind of queries. So it's really great. And then last but not least, we have Cloud Data Catalog um, and Composer are both now uh, in beta and in, and in GA. Data Catalog is our metadata, metadata store. So that's where you find all of your different uh, information. If you, at some point, if you reach the right size on Google Cloud, you don't really know anymore who has your tables and who has your data sets and who has what and where they belong. And Data Catalog gives you a unified view of all of those. And finally, AI and ML. Um, we have BigQuery ML. If you haven't played with it, um, do it. And we have BYOM, bring your own model. That's pretty cool. So that's a new BigQuery feature that you can build your own TensorFlow model and plug it into BigQuery and then call it as part of an SQL. That's pretty nice. So um, I'm not sure if Reza is gonna show a demo on that later. Are you Reza? No, I have a small piece. He has a small piece on it. So definitely stay for Reza's talk later and he's going to talk about this. Um, then we have new um, new models for AutoML. AutoML is our, is our automated uh, machine learning solution where we optimize the machine learning architecture for you even. So you don't even have to choose the architecture of your model. You're automatically, um, you just have to give your source data and we figure out the best, uh, the best model. One of the um, data scientists, the machine learning experts on my team said, um, by now it's so good, it's really hard to beat. So even for machine learning experts, to reach that level of AutoML quality is serious work right now. You can't just you know, go into, um, go into your, like a Jupyter notebook and define a quick model, like this is actually getting really, really good. Um, and then we have a few new APIs. Um, just to quickly recap, AutoML is used if you wanna train your own model and then you have your complete own model. APIs you pay by call. So this is like official APIs that we offer you, Vision API for instance, where you just pay for each kind of call. So super easy, serverless, even from the command line, you can just do it. Now we have a lot more APIs. So for instance, we have a document understanding API that gives you sentiment analysis, structure, paragraphs, all of those kind of things. You have a product search API. So now you can find your own products or how people are reacting to your products. 
We have the contact center, that's for call centers. So in call centers, to understand what do people want actually during a call. And we have a recommendation engine as well. So where we can, um, where we can give you recommendations for existing data. <coughs> and last but not least, we have the AI, the AI platform. The AI platform is our new umbrella term for all of the AI products. Why do I mention it here? It, was, it wasn't actually a Cloud Next um, announcement. All of you realized that, right? Yeah, I snuck that in. Um, why? Because um, many people were asking us in the past what's happening with Data Lab and how does it work together with Colab, which, is, which are our two notebook solutions. Now we have notebooks in AI platform and that's really um, the next step. So you can just really maintain notebooks and collaborate on them as part of AI platforms. So that's really nice. ML remains separate, right? Sorry? ML, ML uh, remains separate? It's all part of AI platform now. Okay. So what used to be Cloud ML is now just called a job or a task, and then they run. So it's all part of, it's all part of AI platform, and it's now all together. Because what you can do now, for instance, is you have a notebook that you're running in AI platform notebooks, and then you want to train it in Cloud ML Engine, and you can do that directly out of the notebook. You don't have to copy the code over somewhere and then like submit it as a job into Cloud ML Engine. Cool. With that, that was a very, very, very quick run through all of my um, favorites. So let me quickly check. I'm a half an hour in. If that's correct, I don't see. Okay, doesn't matter. So um, yeah, I have a few more details now and videos. But before that, I'm going to ask you again for questions because videos, you know, all of us are tired. Afternoon, we're waiting for pizza. So um, I want to give you a moment to quickly ask questions. Haven't had any questions from those? People over there. You have asked so many questions already. And I know you, you have my email address, so you can ask me later. Any questions here? To anything I said? Partic any particular interesting announcement that you like? Um, yes. One question from yes. Website. If you could elaborate a bit more on the uh, superiority of the data fusion over the data prep. Oh, okay. okay. So a little bit more difference regarding data fusion and data prep. Um, Basically, Data Fusion um, is based on an open source framework called CDAP, and it's creating Spark jobs for you. So the advantage is, again, that you can actually handle this. You, can, you, you create it in a nice UI, but in the end, it's a regular Spark job. So if you're coming from a Spark world, you feel comfortable. There's no magic. Um, data prep is really one step back. That's for data scientists who want to clean up the data, who want to who want to um, apply a little bit of business logic, but this is all in the UI and you have no idea what's happening behind the scenes. Right? This is really, this is a magic tool. So think of it as like almost like serverless. So this is a tool for data scientists, data prep, that you use to clean up your data. Um, whereas Data Fusion is a full-blown UI where you can build very complex ETL pipelines and then they run on Spark and you can investigate the Spark jobs yourself with all of the Spark and Hadoop tools that, that you know. So What's the purpose of data flow? Oh, data flow? That, well, data flow is one of the runners that Fusion supports. So data flow is similar to Spark, right? So you can, in data Fusion, you can say, I want to run this on Spark, or I want to run this on data flow. I don't have a nice picture. I would show you a nice picture, but I didn't have a nice picture in the stack. There's, there is a nice picture on the website. OK, a few of my personal favorites that um, didn't get enough callouts. My absolute number one is open source partnerships. Uh, has anyone heard of that? Because it was in the keynote, but somehow no one ever asked me about this. So basically, um, we announced that we now want to work way closer than just a marketplace with open source companies. And that means that through Google Cloud, you can now get the products directly, like for instance, Elasticsearch, including the billing and the support. So you don't have an extra contract, you don't have a separate support contact, it's all completely fronted by Google. But we work with those companies. We are not stealing the technology and just running it on premise. This is still completely this company. So if you have your own licenses, you can bring them in. So you have all of the freedom, you still interact with those companies, but through a single pane of glass that's, that, that's provided in the cloud console. And I think that's really cool. So we have this nice video here, but the audio doesn't work well. So let me see if that, um, if you can hear it. If not, we, but we skip recently, it. recently, the open source community has found that cloud providers are not partnering with them, but attempting to take away their ability to monetize open source. We as Google do not believe that that is good for customers, for the developer community, or for software innovation. 
As a result, we have partnered with leading open source companies to deliver open source to our developer community and customers in new ways. We're very pleased today to announce the first integrated open source ecosystem. What this allows you to do as a developer or as a customer is to use the best of breed open source technology. You can procure them using standard Google Cloud credits. You get a single console, a single bill from Google. We support these along with the partners. And as you grow and use these technologies, we share our success with our partners. So we're fostering this new open source community to ensure that open source continues to thrive and has a vehicle to grow in this world. Let's hear now from the chief executive officers of some of our important partners about why this matters so much to the world, to the developer community, and to the ecosystem. When you change infrastructure, it's very much akin to changing the infrastructure in a city. It's no small undertaking when there's already buildings that exist. That's why we turn to Google Cloud as a partner. When I talk to customers, the common theme I hear from every customer is they want to be able to innovate more quickly. But the data landscape is more complicated than it used to be. People need to actually bridge between all these different systems. All the devices, all... Okay. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not going to show you the full video, but I think you get the idea, and I think it's actually really exciting. Um, because yeah, sometimes it's just better that you that you work together with partners, and I think it's a it's a great solution. We had this in the past already with the marketplace, um, but uh, but I actually prefer this way because now you can walk together with a partner into a customer meeting and really make sure that you get the best thing done for the partner, and not have some product that doesn't is not really offering all the things that the partner wants to do. And that was always a bit of an like awkward situation. And now we can really work together with our partners. Anthos, um, we spoke about it a little bit before. It's our, hybrid, it's our hybrid cloud services platform. Um, the whole GKE on-premise story is really only a very, very small part of it. It's, it's, the, it's the whole control plane of all of your services. So you can imagine it, it's similar to, for instance, like OpenShift or Pivotal Cloud Foundry, those kind of things, but on a way lower level because we're not enforcing any frameworks on you. It's all working together with containers or VMs. It's working on your network stacks. So it's a, it gives you all of the advantages of a real service mesh, of a service platform, without locking you into specific programming languages or specific um, frameworks or specific build processes. All of that is, is just taken away. So it's just all open source components. You can conf configure them any way you like. And I mentioned, for instance, before Traffic Director. This is then a separate product. You can use it or not. Uh, Cloud Run as well. So it's, like it's, it's really a plug and play for, for an open service mesh uh, platform. What I wanted to show you quickly is a really cool tool that's called Anthos Migrate that migrates VMs from on-premises directly into the cloud as uh, containers running on GKE. So I'm quickly gonna I'm quickly gonna run that video as well. So what if I told you that we have a streamlined way of taking this application and moving it to GKE, moving it into containers, so that you don't so this have runs to in, have that's the separate on premise. OS and VM dependency and maintenance. Well, that would be kind of a game changer. So what I'm gonna do is demo that. We have actually built a vSphere plugin that's running here that's going to show you over here all of the changes that'll take place. So we'll look at recent tasks to see what's happening. And this plugin is also connecting to our cloud over a van optimized connection so that all I need to do is to go to GKE and from there I can initiate this migration. So let me do that. I'm gonna go to my cluster. This is a cluster running in Europe and I'm gonna go ahead and using our handy dandy cloud shell, start a, a command line environment and establish a connection to that cluster. This is just standard. So now I'm connected to that cluster and in that cluster, I'm gonna begin this migration. So that's as simple as kubectl apply from this file, which is 
a migrate animal file. And what this file is going to do is it's going to initiate a shutdown of the VMs on prem. It's going to sh gracefully shut those down, take a snapshot, and then move that VM to uh, to uh, this cluster over here. And so, let's go back to the cluster for a second. Minimize this. If I look at workloads, you'll start to see that there are two new pods that are starting. These are actually actually stateful pods that are going to house the application as it migrates over. Uh, and that's going to take a little bit of time. So let's go back and actually see what's happening in the vSphere screen. I told you that we could monitor what's going on here. And so you see here, hopefully you can see it still even from the back, um, you know, we, the, um, we have initiated guest OS shutdown and we're re so you can believe me, it's gonna it's gonna continue pretty cool, but uh, yeah, um, you can watch it yourself uh, if you like. It actually it it works, uh, believe me. <laughs> um, it was on the on stage as well. So that's that's a that's a very very cool feature of Anthos. Uh, we spoke about Cloud Run already a little bit, so I'm gonna I'm not go so much into details here. Um, but what I mentioned earlier was um, write the code your way. Don't um, don't rely on any kind of like serverless frameworks. Um, just deploy wherever you like. Deploy it as a cloud function. Deploy it directly out of IntelliJ, directly out of VS Code, or deploy it to your cluster or GKE on prem. Um, you can directly use all of the serverless serverless uh, serverless services um, that you're used to. All of the other managed services, of course, in Google Cloud Platform, PubSub, BigQuery, whatever you like. You just connect to those, and it's all in the exact same experience, and it's all open source. So there's no no magic behind that. So that was for me um, really cool. Playing with that is really nice. Uh, and to be honest, a little side note here, um, because I was also, like I'm an engineer inside Google, and for me, this is now really the point where Google Cloud feels to feel like we develop code internally. Um, it's really this, like we don't have to, sometimes clients ask me, oh, but how do you run this application, or how do you run that? And my answer is always, well, it's, it's all services, it's all containers, it's all in Borg. Like we don't have those distinctions. To be honest, like very often we don't even think about something as a batch or as a stream. Like it's all, it's just code. And with Cloud Run, we're really now coming to this point. Um, and that's for me really exciting because I always struggled a little bit when I was working with clients um, to, to make sure that I'm, that I'm explaining it in the words that work in their context and not in mine. And now we're suddenly coming to a world where I can just give my experience that I have from every day developing code directly to the client and explain it in the terminology of Cloud Run, which I, which I really like. I don't have to now struggle and talk about, ah, yeah, so in, in you first do Jenkins, and then, and then that's, it's, it's a bit clunky for me to remember that, and now I can finally use that. So it's really exciting for me personally to give all of the experiences from Borg that we already brought into Kubernetes now across the whole experience. Not sure how many of you have read the SRE book, for instance, but all of those principles are part of that, um, and go into the monitoring and the testing and uh, releasing and canaries and all of those features are part of it and that's very nice because now you can talk about those things rather than just having a big SRE book and Kubernetes and saying this is how it should be done and now go go and prosper. Um, yeah, so that's really nice for me. Okay, I think I'm almost out of time so I quickly look around. Okay, okay, cool. So I do... I have a question. Yes? Understood that actually uh, we can send it somewhere for notifications using Google Cloud Events yeah. and trigger it. So if someone tried to ask, like, how would I decide whether Cloud Functions or Cloud Run is better for me? How do we? Okay. That? So and the question was, how do I decide between Cloud Functions and Cloud Run? Um, so, look, my personal opinion is, and this is not an official Google statement, <laughs> um, that probably at some point you you don't have to decide that anymore. Uh, because it's just part of your process inside Cloud Run. Like, it wouldn't be very different products anymore. It's just a part, like, you as a coder, you really shouldn't care. Like, maybe there's someone still in operations who says, oh, for cost reasons, I want to optimize this for cost per request as opposed to cost per instance or cost per, I don't know, over a continuous amount of time. Like, those kind of decisions someone will make. Whether you are making that decision, I guess at some point doesn't really matter anymore, I would say. So at the moment, you can still use Cloud Functions, but really give, uh, give Cloud Run a try. Um, I, think, I think in the long term, if you stay close to that model, it's, it's probably going to be, um, be better for you in the long term. Yeah. Because you're, also, yeah, you're not locked into any other kind of framework. So you can always use Cloud Run anywhere else as well. So you're not 
you're not dependent on Cloud Run. If you don't like Cloud Run, then you just take the code and copy it back into a function. But at least you've tried something that can do more than just the Cloud function. That's how that's I would argue. OK? Cool. Um, data from BigQuery, Reza is going to give an amazing talk about that later. So I'm just going to mention it. Huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm not selling anything. People are here only for you. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm like one of those bands that is like before the actual main act band. That's, and that's, um, that's why I'm here. Um, yeah, so for the ones who've seen me before, I'm a big BigQuery fan. I do a lot of BigQuery, so I'm just going through this again. Um, we spoke about the BI Engine uh, integration, so basically our in-memory BigQuery store to, uh, to provide that. I have a quick video on this. Um, we also have a lot more templates now in Dataflow, so if you never did that in the UI, go to the UI, check out what we call the template. So for instance, importing something from GCS into BigQuery is much easier, so test those out. Um, and for BigQuery itself, that's a, that's a launch that, a, that went a little bit below the radar, but actually what's super important is something called the High Throughput Storage API. That's the third way of ingesting and reading from BigQuery. So we only used to have basically two ways, streaming or batch loads. And for reading, it was basically running a query or using the REST API. And this is now a gRPC driven API that for some customers is like an order of magnitude faster than anything they had before. Because they're basically streaming out the events directly from BigQuery without having to translate it into JSON or something like that. And that's where we get a real big um, speed up. So have a look at this. This is actually my last video. I'm quickly uh, going to show this. This yeah, is from the Kunch from AirAsia. We moved it over to the BigQuery engine and the pipelines that we have. We're able to go ahead and distribute this uh, daily. Uh, and customers uh, or our end clients can help go ahead and drill down and use it. So I'll go to example here. We have the date range. But if I was interested in, uh, let's go ahead and say uh, MY nationality, I can just click on that. It's using the BI engine in the background. It filters. <laughs> everything uh, pretty quickly and if I was interested in this floor layer layer route I can go ahead and click on that and it sub seconds uh, goes ahead and changes the data across uh, which is uh, fantastic because when, when you're in a meeting you can refer to this dashboard as uh, the Bible and everyone's looking at the same thing so you can get up to uh, many many users on it. this is a copy of the real one uh, so obviously there's only one person on it right now but uh, when we're in meetings you can get up to like a, a lot a lot of people on it. we have around uh, you know, uh, thousand to uh, pe folks in marketing and commercial. So you can imagine we can get uh, about 200 people looking at this on a daily basis. Uh, not all concurrently, but concurrently, I usually see around 50 to 60 people using. And now with BI Engine, uh, the way that it works, it, it really makes it easy and fast for people to go ask that question and leave the meeting with real concrete action items versus actually waiting for a report back and asking a question and then having another meeting on the report. So. It works quite well. Um, we, uh, let me just reset everything. Uh, and you can see here, if, as I filter along, it's pretty responsive and fast uh, on how it works. So it's, it's quite impressive for us. So yeah, so that was BI Engine. Um, yeah, really cool, I think. Um, especially because it's live. And just to, just to give you an idea, um, sorry, I can't get it to full screen. Oh, I have to go first, but then back. Um, and this is like on all of their sales data, right? This is not like some small data set. We're talking about basically just like it's the full sales database. That's a big query, right? Massive scale. Um, you don't need to create views or materialized views or whatever status anymore. You just, this is just on all of your data because that's what you want in a meeting. You just want to drill down. And so he actually shows that in the demo. Um, last but not least, uh, security enhancements. We have a lot of security enhancements. I mentioned in the very beginning. Have a look at Security Command Center. It's pretty awesome. Also have a look at Fossetti. Um, Fossetti is our security scanner that's actually developed by professional services um, to, to not only scan Google Cloud, but scan anything else as well. So it's an, it's an open source solution. Have a look at that um, for rules. And um, one last thing that I really want to call out here um, that uh, we have on Google Cloud and that right now clients have asked me a lot is two new features that we have. Um, that's access approval and access transparency services. Um, it's interesting that this is never really mentioned so publicly. So what does that mean? Access transparency means you see in your audit logs every time anyone from Google accesses anything from you. That no other cloud provider offers that to you. You see every time if a support engineer, if a VM is migrated or something happens, a security patch is applied, whatever, um, this, this always shows up in your logs. 
And access approval on top of that is now a new um, offering that we have that you can actually decide whether you want that access to happen, yes or no. So that's really, really cool. That gives you complete full control. There's no backdoors, nothing. This is complete control over everything you run on, uh, on Google Cloud. So that's, that's actually, a, that's actually a, a really, really cool feature. And you see, yeah, basically everything locked, everything in your audit locks, everything that's happening, even for infrastructure components that you normally don't know and that you, that, that you don't really care about. But sometimes you do, and that's, um, it's, still, it's still important. So what's the, what's the definition of the unit? What is access to? For the access approval. Yeah. So the question is, what is um, what is um, what's the unit? So um, there's 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 very different ones um, that can be anything from a from a VM security patch if you have like auto um, auto upgrade enabled down to, for instance, let's say you're raising a ticket to cloud support and saying my data flow job is not running anymore and I don't know why. Um, then that person might have to access the locks of that job, you will see that, the job access. Um, let's say you raise a ticket to cloud support and say, I'm running this big query query and it's taking too long. Um, and then that person also runs the same query against your original data set that will also turn up there. So everything. So it's very fine grain, not just like a big bulb. No, no, it, it, it goes down to every single action that we're, that we're doing on your behalf. Yeah. Um, and that's it actually for me. I think I'm pretty much on time. Did I go a lot over time? Ah, okay, cool, awesome. <laughs> so yeah, thank you all very much. Any last questions? Otherwise I'm still here. Okay, cool, thank you very much. <laughs>